Right, welcome back everybody. Um, I have a game with me, Jay, and um, I have a question um, relating to his years, decades of uh, ministry and evangelizing uh, to Muslims. So Jay, what I'd really like to know is how has your approach to uh, Muslims changed over the decades, over those years, with the changing uh, socioeconomic and political narrative that encompasses Islam and the changing attitudes of the general population towards this religion. Well, well, um, okay. Now, I, just so you know, I've been in ministry to, in the Islamic world for almost 40 years. So we're talking about four decades. Uh, so that really makes me old. And you can now understand why I have gray hair and wrinkles on my face. And uh, I'm, I'm in my mid-60s, coming towards my 70s. So in, in the, all those 40 years, there has been a move. There has been a great movement, a difference in, in mm -hmm. mental and you're, this is the question you're asking. What kind of methodology has moved? Well, when I started back out in the 1980s, that shows you how old what we're talking about. In the 1980s, the beginning beginning of the 1980s, I was I went to Fuller Seminary in California, and there I learned what is today called the insider movement. We didn't have that name for it. It wasn't called that. It was called contextualization. And I used the contextual model. And so when my wife and I first went to Africa, we went to Senegal, West Africa, and we spent five years starting out with this model, the contextual model. That means we walk, talk, eat, drink, sleep, did everything a Muslim did. I was known as Yusuf Khan. That was my name. My wife's name was Nafisatu Khan. Our son's name was Sher Khan. So we were the Khan family. And we lived in a, in a strong Muslim neighborhood there. Um, we were the only Christians in, the entire, in that entire half of the city. Uh, we uh, went. I did. I went to the mosque with all my Muslim friends. I prayed at the mosque uh, there. I grew a beard. I have a huge. If you look at my pictures, I had an enormous, radical beard way down to here. Um, it was. It was quite. It made me look fierce. And I wore these beautiful grand boobus, these nice filigree robes that you could buy there in Senegal. Boy, did I look great. And uh, I did the Ramadan fast with my neighbors on either side, all Muslim neighbors. And so I thought that I was doing the right thing. This is called contextualization. Um, be to all, be, uh, do all things for all men in, in, in their context. And it was about a few months after doing this that one of the chefs, one of the marabouts, they call them marabouts there in Senegal, came up to me and clapped me on the back. And he said, Yusuf Khan, we're so glad to see you become a Muslim. And I said, what? Um, no. I had not become a Muslim. I give, asked permission for you to come to your mosque and to pray to Jesus Christ. You'd given me permission to do so. I never said I was a Muslim. I'm just trying to contextualize. He says, oh, oh but you don't understand. If you start, if you wear a grand boobu, only Muslims wear grand boobus here in Senegal. Only Muslims go to the mosque and pray. Only Muslims do the Ramadan fast. And I realized that the message I was giving was not the message he was receiving. Right. This is a common mistake we have as Westerners, especially Americans have this mistake. I know in Britain they have the same mistake, the same error, the thinking that if I say this thing, they must get it because of the way I'm acting, the way I'm dressing, without realizing that Islam defines its own parameters. It itself st stipulates who, how they're to dress. We cannot impose that on them. It decides what prayer is. We do not have a right to do that. It decides what a fast is. We don't have a right to do that. And for a Muslim, if you wear a certain dress in Senegal, not other places, but in Senegal, yeah. the Grand Boubou was only relegated for Muslims. The Catholics never wore uh, Grand Boubous, I found out later. And I had to give away all those Grand Boubous. They were expensive. They were beautiful. I loved them. And I had to wear these kind of pajama called anangos that looked boring. But I had to do that because the, so they got the right message. It was a neutral dress, and it's what the Catholics and the and the pagans always wore, but not not the Muslims. So it was fascinating that I had to change everything, and I had to move out of the mosque, and I had to stop doing those prayers. So that's why I don't go into mosques today and pray. I won't do it because I know that Muslims will misinterpret that. In the same token, I don't think we should demand that Christ, uh, the Muslims come to churches and get up and sing those worship hymns with us or pray when we pray and certainly not take communion. We yeah. would be offended if they took communion. So for the same reason, we need to be careful about contextualization. And I realized that I needed to leave contextualization and move then towards 
what I call apologetics and polemics. And that's where that all began. And that's when I went back and I came across a man named Dr. Carl Fander from the 1800s who used this and did this enormously all over. Uh, he did it in the Middle East. He did it in uh, in the Balkans, and he also did it in India, primarily in India. Back then, Pakistan, India, and Bangladesh were all one country. So he did it in all those three countries. And he was amazing at what he did. Uh, he, and it was his model that I used. That's why we call ourselves Fander Films. That's why I am Fander Man. I named myself after him. I'm the Fander Man. Now, it's P-F-A-N, so it's Fander. It's, it's a German spelling. He was a German. He had his doctorate. He got his doctorate in Islamics. And he learned seven languages. But what he did... Wow. He was the first one that I'm aware of that actually went to the original, or not the original, but the earliest uh, uh, er earliest documents on Islam. So he went to the Sira, he went to the Tafsir, he went to the Tahrik, he went to the Hadith. He went to all these, translated them into German and then into English, and then confronted them from within. And he confronted two areas. He confronted the Quran and he confronted Muhammad. But always right. when he confronted these two, he then always followed it by defending the Bible and defending Jesus Christ. So he was the first one to start this whole paradigm of the Book of the Man. Now, he didn't call it that. That's my name for it. Yeah. I did my doctoral thesis on him, on his methodology. And that's where I learned my craft of apologetics and polemics. And basically what he was doing in the 1800s, I'm now doing in the 21st century. So there's nothing new under the sun. This has been going on for 200 years. So what I do now, okay, and you've seen this. I've done this now for 25 years at Speaker's Corner. I'm doing it now on the internet. I do it on my Zoom webinars. I am confronting the Quran, confronting Muhammad, confronting Allah, defending the Bible, defending Jesus, and defending Yahweh. So I've taken one more step than Fander. I put the, 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 the two names of God in there as well. But do you see me really going on any other area? No. I spend all my time looking at the historical critique of how Islam began and the historical critique of how the Quran was written. And then I go and I really do take on who this God Allah is and what are the historical antecedents for this name? Where did he come from? And that's about whole, the, whole, the whole context of Petra. Where did Islam begin? It did not begin in Mecca. It began in Petra. And where is this? Why is the, are the Nabataean quotas? Why are the Nabataeans so important in this? Well, these are the areas that I'm spending off all, most of my time on right now. But I'm doing what I should have been doing 40 years ago. I should have not gone into the contextual model. I should have stayed with apologetics and polemics. Now, what better place to do that than Speaker's Corner? Yes. You're there. I mean, you're yeah. not there right now because of the pandemic. But if your yeah. pandemic was around, you're going to go right back as soon as this recedes. You're going to oh. go right back because that's the bastion of freedom of speech. Corner is the best place yeah. to try your material, to get your new ideas, to put out what we call white papers, to get the reaction for the Muslims, to look at those reactions, and then to come up with better arguments. And since back and forth, cut and bury is unique to Speaker's Corner. There's no other place on earth like it. You are so fortunate. You live in London. I loved living there for 25 years, and I've been doing this since 1992 in London. Anytime I come wow. back, to London, I come back to Speaker's Corner because that's the place where you learn your craft. That's the place where you get your message out. And now with iPhones and and uh, 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 these smartphones, you can now record everything you do and get it online, and you can live stream it immediately so people can react to it all over the world. Well, what a venue, what a place, and what a methodology. I much prefer apologetics and polemics. Apologetics to defend what I believe, polemics to go on the offense, what they believe. And always show, doing side by side, which is the better book, which is the better man, and which is the better God. And in every case, we've got the better man, the better book, and the better God. Amen to that. Thanks. Um, I guess within my question, um, just like to wrap this segment up, um, I was thinking in terms of his, uh, just recent history, we've had in uh, the UK at least, we've had um, maybe archbishops, kind of cardinals, inviting Muslims to speak in churches and to pray to Allah. So as far as I'm aware, um, the kind of narrative within the church, at least externally, is that Allah is Yahweh. They, there, as we know, there is only one God, but they, they uh, mistakenly believe that this uh, revelation is. I don't know if they think of it as like an amendment or something to be tolerated, but they, they come back to the idea that it's the same God. Um, whereas Muslims, I find, are not generally under that illusion, um, even though that they, they may kind of say, you know, they believe that the the Bible was revealed by Allah. They, uh, they don't recognize the name Yahweh, and they for sure don't recognize recognize rather the triunity of the one true god um but thanks ever so much for that answer and uh we'll be back soon uh with another one
Right, welcome back everybody. And uh, my final question uh, for Jay uh, to wrap this up is uh, related to the Bible and to Christianity. Um, and it's this, basically within the uh, scripture, we are told that those who are saved can never be snatched from the Father's hands. And yet also, um, paradoxically, we are told that people can convert to other religions, they can lose their faith, they can uh, become you know, sinful in essence once again. And the uh, common response that I find is that those people were never saved um, because of the verse that I uh, referenced. So Jay, I just wonder what's your feeling about this? Do you think that people can be kind of in and then out and then in again? Um, yeah, basically that's my question. Yeah, and, and my answer to that real quickly is yes, they can lose their salvation and they can gain it back again. And this is this is what choice is all about. This is if we are given free choice, as I believe we are, Adam and Eve were given that choice in the very beginning. Uh, then it stands to reason that if that choice has a re, has a, has a repercussions for it, every choice you make has a consequence. And that's why if you have a choice to believe, you also have a choice to unbelieve. Otherwise. We're, we're, if, if that choice is taken from us, then we're then we're pretty much we're following a God that's very similar to Islam. The Islamic God, Allah, is like that. He does not give you that choice. You are not. You don't become a Muslim. You are a Muslim by birth. In yeah. Christianity, you have to make a believer's decision, and that's why we have believers' baptism. We practice that, and I'm I'm speaking for myself. There are probably a lot of Christians who don't agree with me, uh, especially those from the Reformed tradition, uh, Presbyterian Church of England. Uh, many of them believe that. If the parents make that choice, and that's why they baptize them. Uh, this is called pedo-baptism. I do not see any scripture where there's any reference for that. I don't see any support for that. I see almost everything in scripture refers to belief. Let me give you an example. If you were to look at every teaching that Christ gave or every parable that he taught, notice every parable, everything he taught had a choice. Have you noticed that? Show me any parable that yeah. doesn't have a choice. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, I never thought of it that way. Yeah. Would he have parable after parable, talk, uh, teaching after teaching, if there was no choice? John 3, oh. for God gave his only begotten son that for those who believe, that's a choice. Yes. It's at, the, it's at the whole basis, foundation of our faith. And even the two references that, that Christians like to go to in Ephesians 1 and also in Romans, those two, if you look at them, if, if you just unpack, let me just take Ephesians 1. Just look at the first verse of Ephesians 1. It's very clear that this is for those who are the saints. That means those are people who already believe. This is not about those who are unsaved. There's nothing in Ephesians that I can see that has to do with unbelief. So let me just read it to you. I've got the, I've got the Bible right here. Paul, the apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, to the saints in Ephesus, the faithful in Jesus Christ. That's verse 2. Mm -hmm. So already he's talking to the believers not the unbelievers and then when you go down to verse 4 for he chose us be in him before the creation of the world to be holy there is the choice we the believers were already believed there's nothing to do with salvation here we were chosen to be holy there is the choice yeah. so when yeah, that, that mirrors with sorry to interrupt you that mirrors with i think john 3 17 uh for those he uh who were predestined and foreknown by god so he already knows the outcome of our choices anyway so I guess that could be used also in so answer to that question. To be, he predestines us to predestine us. The predestination means that we cannot be taken out of his hands. Yes. That answers your first question. So yes. those of us who have chosen God, nobody can take them away from God. You can God will not allow you to take them away if you have chosen him. That's how yes. you need to read that. But this idea of predestiny that he somehow predestine everybody at the very beginning as to who's going to live and who's going to die. If that were going to case, then I would suggest, I would want to know what, what's the purpose of, why am I doing what I'm doing? Why am I spending almost 40 years trying to help Muslims to come to Jesus Christ if God has not predestined them? He's already decided. And if you believe that God has predestined only mostly Americans and Europeans and lots of South Americans, but no Muslims to go to heaven, then mm. we might as well just give up and go home. No, because thanks. Are we, yeah. we even think that we can fight against God's predestination or his belief. So I would suggest that I, I, the whole evangelistic task, when God says to go into the world, baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, that's the commission, the great commissioning, is so that we will go to everyone so that they have that choice. And that's why I yeah. believe that, no, God will not allow those who have made that choice, he will not allow them to be taken out of his hands. 
That's so secure. And that's why I thank God that he protects me so that I cannot lose my salvation once I have chosen him. Now, that means can I go in, in, un, in unbelief or unchoose? Yes. And I have friends who have done that. I have a cousin who has done that. She no longer believes in Jesus Christ. And she used to be ahead of, of her Sunday school. And one of the best, one of the best believing uh, Christians I've ever met. But what's fascinating to me is those who do believe in Christ, those who do stay true and stay sanctified to Christ Jesus, God will not allow us to be plucked away. God will protect us. And that's why we have the Holy Spirit. That's why the Holy Spirit continues right here as we're speaking. Okay? He's right here amongst us. And God said that. Jesus said that before he left in John 14 and John 16. I'm going to leave him with you to protect you, to teach you so all things that I have said and to be with you inside you, even in us. He's in us right now helping us so that we don't make the wrong choice. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, just to wrap up, I guess, as you were speaking, I was thinking, um, yeah, I suppose the, the beauty of Christianity and evangelism is that even though the father knows already who will be saved and who is saved, uh, we don't. Um, so that's the great thing about evangelism that we, I was discussing this earlier, funnily enough, that we can't know and therefore we must, we know that God can save to the uttermost. And we must uh, attempt at least to make disciples um, of all nations. And therefore, everybody deserves to uh, have the opportunity to come to Christ and also to answer for that decision on Judgment Day if they politely decline. So um, thanks ever so much for your answer. And um, that wraps up this section. Right, welcome back, everybody. Um, I'm here again with Jay, and uh, I'm going to jump straight into the question without the introduction because, as you know, he's um, a Quranic expert, an author, a YouTuber, um, etc., and he's probably embarrassed at this point. So I'm going to jump right in. And um, so, following his um, for the last fortnight, um, most of you uh, should be aware that Founder Films on YouTube has produced. Um, quite a few, uh, 12 uh, videos in two weeks, and each of them are related to uh, a current debate that's uh, ongoing between uh, King and Gibson, and the topic of which has elicited a question from somebody I know, so I'm gonna put that to Jay right now. And the question is, how did, uh, how did Jay verify the direction of each of the Petra era mosques? Um, that means little to me, but I'm assuming that most people know. Um, yeah. yeah. Okay. Let me just go ahead and introduce what we're talking about, so people can understand that uh, the, this this debate is a, is ongoing because the, uh, uh, Dan Gibson uh, did a well for since 1989 up to 2004. So we're talking about for 25 years he spent his life for 25 years going to the Middle East, going to Jordan, going to these countries where these oldest mosques were. Now remember, the mosques were only beginning to be built in the seventh century. So he went to every one, over a hundred of these mosques. And he kept on finding that these mosques up until 706, so that's the early eighth century, all of the mosques were facing Petra, not Mecca. But in seventh century, in 621 or 624, according to the Quran itself, in chapter 2, verse 149, it says very clearly that all the mosques, the Qibla, were supposed to face towards Mecca, not yes. Jerusalem, but Mecca. And that was in 624. And all of the traditions, all of your Islamic traditions support that notion that the Qibla was canonized in 624 from Jerusalem down to Mecca. Which means any mosque after 624 is supposed to be facing Mecca, correct? Yeah. We found that none of the mosques were facing Mecca. There was no Mecca. Uh, Dr. Patricia Corona, who is one of the world's leading authorities, she's now dead for two years, but she reads and writes 15 languages. She has found that there is no reference to the city of Mecca at all until 741 AD. 741 is the mid-8th century. That's yeah. over 100 years after this. There is no reference on any maps. It doesn't appear on any maps until 900 AD. It doesn't appear in any inscription or any writing until 741 AD. Muhammad died in 632 AD. The Quran, yeah. sorry, the, the Qibla was supposedly canonized in 624 AD. And all the mosques that Gibson found, which he went to physically, were mm -hmm. facing. So how did he come and how did he know where these were facing? What was his tools that he used? And this is the question you're getting to. Well, the tools he used were what we call aster satellites, which are the most uh, uh, 
exact tools for finding exactly where anybody is anywhere in the world within a few yards. This is not Google Maps. Google Maps, uh, you only use Google Maps for large uh, places because the Google map does not take into consideration the curvature of the earth. Astro satellites do. And that's why only experts use this. And that's why Dan used these coordinates. He used coordinates like anybody else who then sent it to Astor, who then gave the coordinates of exactly what that, that direction was. And that's why he was able to measure the coordinates of all of these Kiblas, these Kibla walls, which are the long walls, not the short ones of any yeah. model. You only have two walls to go with either mm -hmm. one or the other. And, you look and see what exactly what coordinates and what he found is that all of these coordinates using the Astro satellites were within two degrees of error. And these mosques were in Jordan, in Syria. They were in as far away as China, thousands wow. of miles away. Cherman in India, Canton yeah. in China, hundreds and thousands of miles away. And yet they were within two degrees of accuracy. What he oh. found also is that when the first mosque that he could find that was actually had a Qibla that was facing Mecca was not till 727. Right. That's over 100 years after the canon canonization of the Qibla, according yeah. to the traditions, according to the Quran. Mm. Sure that there's a problem. But what he's noticed is that after 727, every mosque, mosque that was facing Mecca were, were over were 4.78 degrees in error almost double the air as yeah. the Qiblas towards Petra, proving that even the mosque towards Petra were more accurate, yet they were older and they should have been therefore more barbaric. And the ones yeah. yeah. were much less accurate and yet they were here and they all use mathematics. So King came with proposition. He just used these 9th, 10th, and 11th century scholars who knew of these misdirected mosques. They didn't know how to understand it. And so they were curious themselves. They had no reference point. And so they just made up all kinds of theories, about 10 different theories for all these reasons why they were all wrong, why all these mosques were not facing Mecca. King, as the world expert, took their theories and just basically mimicked them, copied them, borrowed their material, and said, this is why they're all wrong. Gibson and says, no, 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 no. These are not in hundreds of different directions. They're only in four directions. And the first one is Petra. And the Petrans are the most accurate. And they didn't have mathematics. They didn't use mathematics. So how did they get their boss so, so accurate? Well, if you got an hour, I can explain all that. We don't have an hour to do that. You can just go to your channel. <laughs> Just go and look at those 12 videos or just go up to Dan, Dan Gibson's channel. He also has a YouTube channel called Dan Gibson. He has six, he has six uh, videos that explain all of this. And what has happened is Gibson has basically destroyed King's entire lifetime work. In just a period of a few years, he found that King was wrong in every case. But see, Gibson went to over 100 mosques physically. He physically went to those mosques. Mm -hmm. Dan, uh, David King only went to one. Right. David King used no modern technology to find out their how accurate they were or how inaccurate they were. He had no idea whether how inaccurate they were. He just he never used that technology. He didn't want to. He didn't need to. He thought the Muslims from the ninth and tenth, eleventh century knew what they were talking about. Without asking, shouldn't he have gone to the seventh and eighth century to when these mosques were being built? Shouldn't he have gone to that era and asked why they were so much more accurate than those who had used mathematics in the ninth, tenth, and eleventh century? Ooh, I love it. So mm -hmm. that controversy and then as you noted at the very beginning that's why king is so upset because his whole legacy his whole world uh his whole work that has been he's been working on for almost 40 years goes right out the window because of a man of a man who doesn't have a doctorate like he has a doctorate does not have a chair like he has a chair is not teaching at a, a reputable institution like he's teaching a reputable institution mm -hmm. that is not known like he's well known does not has not had the accolades like he's had the accolades here's yeah. a archaeologists who just lived on the field, learned the language, went amongst the people, went to the places that were in question, and actually did the measurements, which is what King should have done, but did yeah. not. Wow, thank you very much. That's really comprehensive, and I know that the guy who asked the question is going to be really pleased with the answer, and obviously everybody else can be directed toward Dan Gibson's channel and to Jay's, which is Vanda Films, here on YouTube. And um, that wraps up that question. Thanks very much, Jay.
Right, welcome back. And uh, following on from our last question about Petra, um, I have another question from somebody else um, in one of my groups, and this is it verbatim. So the question is, um, can you ask Jay to speak more about the Nabataean slash Syriac connection? And again, I've not much of a clue what that means. So yeah, over to you. That. That's a very good question. And it does follow exactly. It's a good segue right into the next idea. If you have all these mosques facing Petra that are so accurate, we need to ask why Petra and why so accurate. And we need, and of course, the answer is very clearly that this is the seat of the Nabataean Empire. Remember, the Nabataeans really didn't have an empire as we know today. They didn't have borders. Uh, they didn't have a capital. They didn't have armies. Who were they? They were traders. The Nabataeans were traders. They were at the forefront of trade from the 2nd century BC all the way up to the 7th century AD. They were the only ones able to cross the deserts. They were the only ones to go from oasis to oasis to oasis. And because of that ability, they were the only ones that could go all the way to China. They were the only ones that could get to India. They were the only ones that could get far to the Far East. And because they could get to the Far East, they were unique. And that's why they controlled the trade. And that's why they didn't need a kingdom. They were merchants who went on camelback. Now, because of the fact they, they had to go across desert, deserts shift. Winds come, sand dunes change. There's no trees, there's no mountains that stay put that you can follow. When you go over these vast mount, uh, hills of sand, yeah. there's no roads there, so what do you do? How do you find your way? The Nabataeans had learned from a very early, time, early age uh, to follow the stars. And they use a simple measurement called, with one block called the Kamalba, K-A-M-A-L, and a string. And they would, they would always, whenever they wanted to go north or south, they would look to where the north star was. The north star always remained constant. It's a very bright star. It's not the brightest, but it's a very bright star in the sky. And it always, always stays constant. So they would always look and know that it's on the north. So they would look and they would put their, their they would pull their uh, block of, away from them until the north star was on the top and the horizon was on the bottom. And they would take the string. And they keep it on their teeth by depending on how far that string went, it had knots along it. And depending on where they stopped, and they could count how many knots were, they knew exactly how oh. many paces they were to go in that direction. Now, hold on. remember, you have to go exactly accurate. Why? Mm -hmm. If you miss it by a few hundred yards, you miss the well, you miss the oasis, you miss where the water was, these were their water wells, there's nothing there to show for it, and if you missed it by even a few hundred paces, you would die. Therefore, yeah, it was just one degree at the center um, of a circle, one degree out, by the time you get to the uh, radius, the circumference of the circle, is com you're completely out. Absolutely. So it could be life and death, yeah. Well, they so. also had to know east and west, so how did they do east and west? Well, they have 32 stars on a round circle. And those 32 stars, they knew exactly where they were in that circle. And they knew that if they were to go so many, they knew from people who had gone in the past, they knew that they had to go so many hundreds of thousands of paces in this stretch and towards that star. Now, after you count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, you can you start running out. After a while, if you get to a thousand, you can easily get off by one or two paces, right? You, get up yeah. by one. you try counting for hundreds of thousands of numbers and see if you are consistent all the way as yeah. you want to and keep in step. I let my phone do it, to be honest. <laughs> they have phones back then. So what did they Thank do? You. How did they do that? They used poetry. And they sang poetry. That's why the Arabs are so well known for their singing cadences. That's why you have these poems that go on for almost half an hour because those poems are what the camel herders used and they would know that they were to go in this direction towards that star this poetry this song with this poetry in it they had to do that five times because that one piece of poetry may be 25,000 steps so they would sing as they walked yeah with the camels and they would then know exactly that and that after they got past these five uh, cadences of that particular poetry, they then knew they had to go to this star and go 125,000 steps. So they wow. would have another piece of poetry and go in that direction. And yeah. that's how they got to these oases is absolutely perfectly. From knowing that, can you then understand why they knew how to use the stars better than anybody else? Yes. That's why they were the only ones able to cross the deserts where no one else could. Mm -hmm. Now, 
By the time the 9th and 10th century came into play, or the late 8th century, mid 8th century, up until the 9th and 10th, 11th, roads were then put in because now this time, now the Muslims now controlled. They didn't need camel herders anymore. They now were in cities. They were now urbanized. They had all these cities, Basra, Baghdad, Damascus, Jerusalem, Cairo, that they had conquered in the uh, mid seventh century. So now mm -hmm. they conquered these cities. They used roads from the, these two cities that went around the deserts. Therefore, they lost this ability to follow the stars. Right. And that's why it changed their accuracy. accuracy. So in, the ninth century, yeah. in the ninth century, these scholars were looking at these kiblas from these old ancient mosques. They were 100 to 200 years older, and they found that they were not facing Mecca. So they said, well, we must come to some conclusion, but they didn't know why that these mosques were not facing Mecca. They didn't bother to look and see that they're all facing Petra. They didn't bother to look and see how accurately they're facing Petra. They just assumed these guys didn't know much because wow. today we have mathematics. Yeah. In the ninth and 10th century, they use mathematics. So they tried to use all these mathematical equations to come up with their Qiblas, which were okay, but they weren't as accurate as those stars. And that's why the Meccan mosques are more inaccurate than the Petran mosques, because that art had been lost. Now, here comes David King, who spent his whole lifetime reading only these 9th, 10th, and 11th century scholars and just taking what they thought. He said, oh, they must know because they're closer to the event and they're Muslims. Therefore, who yeah. am I, as a British man, know, how can I know better than the Muslims? So therefore, he took their word, assumed that they were correct. And of course, they were trying to justify all these misdirected Qiblas. And they were saying it was because of the equinox. They were following the, uh, the solstice lines. They're following the equinox lines. In this case, they were following Roman uh, ruins. In this case, they were, uh, in this case, with all the mosques that were facing straight south in northern um, Africa and also in Spain, those were going face straight south because they were following Roman roads. They were following churches that they had taken over, destroyed, and built over top of the church. The problem is they we're all following the same direction. Yeah. They didn't take that into consideration. And mm -hmm. what's more, if they didn't know where Mecca was, then how could they make the pilgrimage to Mecca? Exactly. They're all making the pilgrimage to Mecca. If they knew how to get there, then how could they build their mosque in that faith, that, that direction? Yeah. Ooh, I love this. And this is why folks don't use 9th, 10th, and 11th century uh, hint or hunches, because these are all hunches. These are nothing more than yeah. theory. Why don't you go back to the 7th and 8th century and actually look and see how accurate they were and then ask how did they get their directions? How did the Nabataeans, who remember, the Nabataeans, Petra was their, there was not their capital. It was their city. It was their sanctuary city. This is a city of tombs and temples. These are the people that, that built those beautiful rock carvings. Take a look at Petra. It is famous for its rock carvings. They were way ahead of the rest of the world. And they always sent their bodies whenever they died on, when they died in China or when they died in India or way up in Turkey, they always sent their bodies back to be buried in their family grave there in Petra. Right. So they always knew where Petra was. And they always used the stars to find out where Petra was. And that's why they were so accurate. And that's why I, if you want to find out about how Islam began, you need to go back to the Nabataeans. And they, well, another reason you need to go back to the Nabataeans is take a look at Petra. And you will find in Petra everything you'll find in Mecca. You will find that Petra has the Marwa and the Safa, the two different hills that you run back and forth from. These were actual hills. They're there today. If you go to Mecca, they're just pieces of rock. Mm -hmm. They've had to put facsimiles of them. So Mecca is the wrong place. It's a second pill. It's a second hunch. It's a second holy city. P uh, Petra also has the Kaaba. And the Kaaba that's in Petra fits exactly with the dim dimensions that we get from the traditions on the original Kaaba. And I could go on and on. Look at the Jamarat. The Jamarat where they throw these stones in Mecca. Those yeah. They have three of them in Mecca. What do they have three for? There's only one referred to. There's only one devil that's referred to that you throw stones on. And that is now been found in Petra. So everything, you remember the Zamzam well? Uh, do you mean to say they've made a trinity of um, stones to be demonized? Not a, trinity, you... not a trinity as we know. It's just three. Well, because... I'm they've made three of them when, in essence, they just need one to well, uh where did the three come from i don't know i'm sorry i thought you said there were multiple so they had a replica of the oh, hills three. yeah the three are the these are the three goddesses Al oh alat aluza and anat some this is a summation we don't know we don't get don't 
quote me on that one. That one, don't quote me on. Because there, there is there's an awful lot of research to be done. What we do, what we can say now is it looks like almost everything that Islam now is, used to already be in the 7th century in Petra, has now been transferred and transposed into Mecca. And the reason, ha the reason for that has to do with the black stone. Now, I'm not going to get into the black stone now. That's a whole other talk for another time. But anyways, to answer your question, the reason they knew they're Af the Nabataeans are so important is because they are the one that gives us Arabic. The Arabic comes from the Nabataean. Uh, the name Allah is the Nabataean god. Ilaha is the god of the Nabataeans, but he is not their formal god. He is nothing more than generic name for their god. So they got the wrong god, the wrong name, the wrong place, and the wrong, uh, the, basically the wrong history. Mecca is not the original sanctuary. It was always Petra. Brilliant answer. I think the person who asked that is going to be absolutely thrilled. I suppose the moral of the story is if you find um, an error, go back to the people who had the right answer in the first place and try to kind of reverse engineer rather than going to the error itself and then, you know, cross-referencing from there. So but thanks. Isn't that, what we that always do? isn't that what we always do? You, whenever you want to find a historical fact, go back historically and go to the earliest text. Go to yeah. the earliest event go to the earliest place because those are the ones that, you have. that kind of a theory go back to the original correct text and uh try and work out what went wrong i guess um Very yeah nice. thanks ever so much jay and uh we'll be back soon with another question thank you very much <laughs>